hearing um, about how in the midst of challenges that come into our life that we have not been prepared for, but from the very beginning of our life, even before you and me were thought about uh, by our parents, God has already provided for us. Even before we were conceived in our mother's womb, God has thought about us. Isn't that a joy that you and me can bask about, can talk about, uh, and can look into uh, the aspect that God thought about us? Hallelujah. When nobody thinks about us, when you may think that people around are not thinking about us, there is a God who is constantly thinking about you and me. Hallelujah. Are there moments in your life when you are, uh, uh, you are total MIA, you are missing in action completely, and you think that nobody notices, you are just missing out everything. But can I tell you something, my friends? My Jesus is thinking about us. He is thinking about us. It's okay that people don't talk about us. It's okay that people don't, you know, try, you know, they run away from the friendships of our life. It's okay sometimes, but always know there is a God who is thinking about us. That gives us the assurance that no matter whatsoever come across my life, be it the Red Sea or the mountain top, but if my God is on my side, I can face it. If my God is on my side, I can overcome it. If my God is on my side, no matter how deep and vast the Jordan may look like, but I can declare one thing. If the Lord is on my side, no matter how vast and deep the oncoming situation and the waves may look like, but if my Lord is on my side, I will overcome it. And that is the promise of my keeper God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I am thankful that we are part of the beautiful Sunday morning where we get to worship our Jesus. When we come here to worship, the worship should happen from the purity of our heart, not just the words from our heart. Let the words that come out of our mouth rise from our heart, rise from the bottom of our heart, and let us declare, Lord, I love you. Let us not go to heaven because we fear hell. Let us go to heaven because we love heaven. It's two different things. A lot of our churches, a lot of our believers, when I talk to them, I want to go to heaven. Why? Because I'm scared of hell. No, you don't want to do that. You want to go to heaven. Be partakers of the heavenly kingdom because you love God. You keep him the first in your life. And that has to be the priority of every single person who come across our churches our fellowship. And I pray, and I pray in our lifetime that God has placed us to be partakers in this godly church or in the church, universal church, the New Testament church. I pray there will be a desire that comes from our heart. Lord, I am desperate for you. I love all the songs of morning that we were singing, especially the songs that the worship team in our English service chose today. The words of those songs, if you could listen to it, it talks about, Lord, I'm desperate for you. I am desperate for you. What is the right word in Malayalam for desperation? Lord, I'm desperate for you. I am desperate. I am desperate. In this life, I am desperate. I am, there's nothing in the entire world that can satisfy me like what your presence does to me. Are you getting this? Are you understanding? There is nothing in this. No riches, no family, no relationships, nothing can satisfy me other than your presence, O oh Lord. And that has to be the song, the anthem of our life. Lord, I am desperate for you. Every morning that I wake up, I can declare within my house, O oh Lord, my family is desperate for your touch. My life is desperate for your move. I am desperate. God can work wonders only if you are desperate for him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Your desperation releases the potential of God to work in your life. Today, how desperate you are for a touch of Jesus. How desperate you are that God will touch our life. How desperate. How desperate we are. As you sit under my voice today for the next couple of minutes, I pray that as we return from this church, 
we are not just ending our worship and returning back, but we are continuing our worship and we are going out of the church. Are you trying to understand this? A lot of us, we make up schedule, 9 o'clock to 12.30, I'm going to be at Zion Church. I'm going to worship Jesus. Yes, that is good. That's the corporate worship. We all worship together here. But when we finish our Ashriwadam and you walk out of this church, I pray and I pray and I humbly suggest that we continue to be in the presence of our master. We continue to take the worship atmospheres from here into the hallway and outside in our parking lot and as you drive to your restaurant or your homes or your families I pray that we continue to be in that worship atmosphere and that is what a Christian church should look like are you trying to understand this that is what a Christian church should look like we wait for a Sunday to gather here to meet with our friends and fellowship with everybody that is true that is really good but even after we finish we walk out we continue to be in the presence of Jesus. Otherwise, the name Christian that you put in your application forms doesn't make sense. It's just a name that you give that you belong to that group, that group, that's it. It has to be a life that we live. I mess up. We mess up. That's where we look into the promise of the scriptures. James chapter 5 is the last chapter that I want to look into as we are looking in the book of James. I want to finish off with James chapter 5 here as today marks the last message from the book of James that we were looking in. Next week onwards, we're looking into the advent, the coming of Jesus Christ, and we're looking into the, 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 the death and the resurrection, and I want to go into a, a more deeper study on that. But today as we close with the book of James chapter 5, I want to bring your attention to words, James chapter 5, verse 16, and the part B of 16, James chapter 5, verse 16. If you can put up on the screens, let's read it together. If you have your Bibles with you, whatever Bible you have with you, please turn that with me or read it together. Let us read together. Can we all read it together? If you have your Bibles, whatever Bible, whatever language you have, let's read it together. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. As it is. The prayer of a righteous person has great power. But before we come into part B of the scripture, James is mentioning, talking, and helping our churches to realize. And I early part of the, the series, I began and I made you understand that even though this was written as the earliest book in the New Testament, as the first ever written manuscript in the New Testament, 2,000 years ago, but even now, it has the relevancy, talking so much power and truth in our 21st day century. Part one, you know, as we read that scripture, it, it talks to us, therefore confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. Can I tell you something? We are in a time and age, even within our churches, that we cannot actually confess our sins with one another. Because we have lost confidence with people. The moment you confess your sin with your pastor or your friend or your mentor within our church, what happens? It just spreads like worldwide radio. They just write a blog about the sins you have committed about your life. But what is James trying to help us understand here? In the New Testament, James is writing the scriptures and letting people know, you know what? When you come to church, have people where you can confess your sin to one another so that the brother or sister you're talking to will help you stand faithful in the sight of the Almighty God. We have missed that in the 21st day century. We don't like people who will correct us. We don't like people who will talk to us good. Why? Because the moment we talk to them about the sins, you know, sometimes if, if you watch carefully with the American church, the way a lot of things work, pastors are very vulnerable. They, they share their life story with the audience. Where They want to show that they're vulnerable in the lifestyles that they have, that they make mistakes too. Sometimes in the Indian circles, when I walk around, I see pastors are all holy angels, so much heavenly minded that they are use of no earthly value. 
And that is the story for every other believer too. But can I also suggest, my dear friends, that we should be people according to the scriptures. When you have committed something, don't go and share your life story to everybody you meet. No. I, had a, I was meeting with this person for the very first time. We met, I was traveling. I was, I was in Springfield, Missouri, traveling to Chicago for a conference. And I met this person for the very first time. And uh, I introduced, I'm going for a conference. I'm going to preach there. And as I shared all that, this person shared his entire life story with me. His entire life story. And I would suggest, you know, unless you find a trustworthy person, don't share your life story with that person. But make sure that you find somebody who is trustworthy, who can keep your secrets and also pray with you in the desire to see that you will come out of the shadow of the evil one. That has to be the desire of every... When I am speaking this message here, I know that everybody here is called for a greater task by God Almighty. And your task is to encourage one another so that they don't fall into the sinful desires of the world. But when they come and confess their sins with each one of us, we help them stand in the faithfulness of God Almighty. It is His grace and His love that has been extended to us. And that's why, you know, uh, we have small groups within our church where um, there are people who mentor the girls. Uh, and, and, you know, uh, as, as we do that, the intention of our small groups, the intention of our small groups is so that people will come and share uh, the stuff of their life with you so that the mentors, the leaders will actually lead them into the saving grace so that we become accountable with one another. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and it doesn't stop there. Pray for one another. Somebody recently asked me, Pastor, my family, I've been praying for them for the last five years. How long should I pray? Pray until they come to the saving grace of Jesus. Your prayer will never go in vain. I, had, I know a sister back in Bangalore, India. She prayed for her husband to come to the saving grace of Jesus for 25 long years. Every Sunday she comes, she worships, she goes back. And her husband abuses her. She, he, he throws her out of the house because she attends the church service. But still, she did not lose our faith, her faith. She comes with a desire and she prays. She, I know families who have prayed for their family members to come to the saving grace for many, many years. And I know we have a testimony within our church. Brother Joe's and Joe's uncle and uh, Brother Joby, they've been praying for their family for many, many, many years. And just recently, one of their brothers came to the saving grace of Jesus Christ. Pray for one another with an intention that they will understand the value of grace extended in their life. Because once, number one, when you confess your sins, you are having a role and responsibility to pray for that person. Don't leave them. Don't talk bad about them because now you know the innermost secrets of their life. Don't talk bad about them because now they have shared the most vulnerable parts of their life with you. But be on their side. Encourage that person. Walk this walk with them so that the same wavelength that you walk, maybe you will help them to enter the righteousness of our Savior. Why do I say that? Because the word helps us to understand the prayer of a righteous person has great power and it is working. Are you righteous here? Bible helps us to understand you and me cannot be righteous without the help of God Almighty. In the very beginning, God ordained that His Son would come to the world and make Make us all right and inherit the kingdom of God with him. And Christ came down, stooped down onto the earthly level, gave his own life so that you and me will be righteous in the sight of God Almighty. To make us right with God is what is righteousness about. To make us right with God. All of us may think, am I right with God? Among friendships and relationships sometimes, you know, you know, one day, Anisha is sitting right here so I can use her as an example. And if you're part of a pastoral family, you're always part of examples and illustrations, right? No, I'm kidding. Sorry, okay? But one day, uh, <laughs> Anisha, you know, she was getting ready for work and I was also at Baylor. We couldn't talk much. I was getting ready and she got ready and she left immediately. I drank the chai that she made and I didn't even 
smile at her. I didn't even say anything. And I left immediately. After some time during lunchtime, because I have not messaged her or anything, she calls me and she asks me, is everything okay? Like, is there anything wrong? Is everything okay? She wanted to know if everything was fine between us. Right? See, that, that's, that's how when, when in the relationship that God has placed, that God has given you people in accountable of, you know, sometimes there are moments when you have to intentionally ask, is everything okay between you and God? Is, is there anything in anywhere that I can help? Is everything okay in this relationship? Are you thinking that you can't do it? Are you thinking that you are now fit for it? The grace of Jesus Christ extended for us makes us right with God. That is what righteousness means. We were all partakers of the sin that Adam and Eve has made. Sin crept into the world and it has tarnished the image of God that God has made. But the work of the cross has restored us back into the faithfulness of God, made us right with him again. And that's why when we look into the part B of the scripture, it helps us to understand the prayer of a righteous is working. Oh, come on. The prayer of the righteous is How many righteous in this house today? Don't doubt. It is the work of God that has made you righteous. That has made you, every single person, turn to your neighbor and say, I am righteousness in the image of God. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am the righteousness in the image of Jesus Christ. I am the righteousness in the image of Jesus Christ. I am the Christu in the snake, I mean, and needy carry you. I am the righteousness of God. Once in a while, I talk Malayalam for the others who don't follow it. That's because some of our Amachis have asked me, Pastor, Korchi Malayalam Parnya Nalla Daidikyum. And I want to honor that. Some of our Amachis are really prayer warriors of our church. I thank you for your, for your prayers. But here in the scripture, as we look into the prayer of a righteous person, we have to understand every time when we come to the house of the Lord, every time, the devil, his work is always to confuse us. If he confuses us, your prayers cannot be effective. Are you trying to understand this? When you come for a prayer, don't just pray because you know all the words. Don't just pray because you know all the scriptures. But pray because there is something within yourself that is pushing you to pray. There's a desire for a breakthrough. There's a desire for a miracle. There's a desire that you have within yourself to see the hand of God working in your life. And even at that moment when you come to the house of the Lord, there are times when the devil will put questions in your own mind. Are you right with God? Can you pray like this? If you pray, will God answer you? Really? If you fast for 40 days, do you think God is going to answer you? Just because it happened for Jesus, you are not Jesus. Do you think this is going to work for your life? Do you think it is going to happen in your life? Because of his life extended into my life, I am being made right with God. And my Bible helps us to understand the prayer of a righteous is working all the time. My dear friends, brothers and sisters, gather in this house and listening to me from wherever you are. You are the righteousness of God. In the image of Christ. And when you pray. Your prayer will work wonders. When you pray. Things will happen. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Can I tell you. Healings and signs and wonders. All part of the story. But what matters the most. Is when we come. Know that your prayer is working. Your prayer is working my friend. You know two weeks ago. I asked your prayers to go to. Uh, to uh, I don't know if you remember. You know, we wanted to go to McKinney area and pray for this boy, young boy who, who are going through this torments of evil spirits and uh, a lot of things that was happening. We prayed. The sister just messaged me two weeks ago. I mean, sorry, two days ago. And she said, Pastor, after that prayer of your church folks, my son has slept through the night. Isn't that the story of miracles? He was waking up 3.30 every morning. 
cutting himself with knife and, and, and throwing the entire house in chaos. But can I tell you, we walked into that home and I knew there were some people who were praying for us. We walked into that home and today they say that their son is sleeping through the night. Why? Because the prayer of a righteous is working. The prayer of a righteous. Are you a righteous person in the sight of God? Your prayer is working. Your prayer is working. Brothers and sisters, every time understand, when you pray, don't doubt. Your prayer will work wonders. Amen. Oh, come on. You may not see the answer immediately. That does not mean my God is not working. He is working. He is working. His delay is not the denial. He is working. He is working. You will see the hand of God in your life. And as I preach this message from the book of James, I want to encourage some of you who are going through that season in your life where you're thinking, I have been praying for so long. I did not see the answer in my life. But can I tell you, claim yourself as a righteous image of God Almighty. And when you pray, know that the prayer of righteous is working. I like the scripture, the next words. Let's look into that. As time runs real quick, let's look into the next prayer. Elijah. The next scripture. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. I love it. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What is James trying to help his beloved people? That You have to understand the, the background of the scripture. What is James trying to help is James is trying to help them understand. You know what? You talk about all these saints. You talk about all these people who have done greater things. Sometimes people, people, you know, there was a sister in my church, old church, you know. She used to come every single day and she has a new problem on a Sunday. Every single day she has a new problem. Really, honestly, I'm telling you. And as a seven, 16, 17 year old, I go to my church and I am standing there to pray. This sister comes to me and she's like, Pastor, today this is the problem. She was a problem sister. This is the problem. And she has some problem. Next Sunday, she has another problem. And in, in, in short, her problems were if a glass falls down from the kitchen top, that is a problem for her. That is just a summary that I wanted to give. If a glass just falls down from a countertop, that's a problem. She wants a prayer for that, right? One day I was tired. Seven months, I know, I was praying. Every Sunday she comes pray. I like praying too. I prayed. One day I realized, why don't I teach her how to pray? Are you trying to understand this? Praise the Lord. Why don't I teach her? And I said, sister, I'm not going to pray for you today, but I want you to pray for yourself. Because you have to understand, you are the righteous image of God Almighty. Your prayer is working as well how you see a pastor's prayer working. You are the righteous image of God. Your prayer will work. Pray. Are you trying to understand this? Yes, of course you want the pastor to come and sit and pray with you. But each one of you, you're the righteous image of God that gives you access to the heavenly places and which makes you open doors that has been shut in your life for many years. You're the righteous image of God Almighty. And that's why James helps us to understand. Elijah was a man, just the nature like ours. I asked this question to a youth group many years ago and they say, Pastor, do you not think Elijah was bipolar? That he changes his mind so much. The one moment he is like, oh God, bring fire and destroy all these people. Next moment he's running for his life. He's like, Lord, I don't want to live. I want to die. And that's why James very carefully looking into the history and the past of the church helps people to understand Elijah was a man with just a nature like ours. Praise the Lord. When we all have a breakthrough in our life, you have to see the kind of worship we have. When we have any sort of breakthroughs in our life, everybody wants to share a testimony. But do you share a testimony when you have a failure in your life? Do you share a testimony when you don't see the work of God in your life? Just to say, God, you have been faithful in my life. Elijah was a man just like the nature of ours. One moment brought the fire from heaven, destroyed everybody. Next moment, he's running for his life. And I know if there are people under my voice, no matter where you are, you might be running for your voice. You might be running from, for your life today. But this is the word of encouragement. Your prayer, if it's worked in the past, stay strong. 
Gird yourself off and let the devil know that somebody who backs you up is the God of your life. He's the God of your life and your family. And he's the one who has called you. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Next time when you go through struggle in your life, remind yourself, James says that Elijah was a man just like ours. What all did Elijah do with one word? You know, one prayer, he defeated the entire, entire idol worshippers and their prophets. With one prayer, you know, he brought the fire down from heaven. With one prayer, he shut the heavens and the rains for three and a half years. With one prayer, he opened up the skies. Why could it happen with him? If it could happen with him, James is mentioning it can happen with you as well. It's not just the God of Elijah. It is the God of our life as well. If it has worked wonders in Elijah's life, it can work. The book of James will help us to understand the God who worked wonders in the life and through Elijah is the same God who can work through my life. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. What are your natures? Everybody, we are all having different natures. All our personalities are so different, so different, so different. Some people need five minutes to boost up in their faith. Some people, the moment you walk into church or the moment you see a struggle, you're ready to face it. Some people, the moment you see a struggle, you run away from it. Everybody's nature is different. And all of this sums up into the lifestyle of Elijah. When you read through the story of Elijah, it just sums up there. Look into the life of Elijah. Look and read through the life and glean and understand the nature of yours is a nature of Elijah. Elijah, and we can understand one thing, the truth in that entire chapter is if the God Almighty could work for Elijah, he's the same God who works for us. The question goes back to the songs we were singing this morning. How desperate are you? How desperate are you? Elijah, you have to understand, in the midst of his desperation is when God worked for him. In the midst of his desperation, the desperate moments in his life is when God opened up the sky, shut the sky, sent the fire down. How desperate are you? Always remember, in the midst of that, remember the promises of God. It all goes back to the scripture that we read today from James chapter 5, verse 16, part A. It talks about, you know, the righteousness of God is revealed in every single person seated in this house today. You're the righteous image of God. And next time when somebody comes up to you to ask for a prayer, listen to what they are confessing. Listen to what they are sharing with you. Pray with a burden that you will see their life will change. Are you trying to understand this? Pray with a burden that their life will change. We can all complain about things. We can all complain. But how much are you ready to pray? We can all complain about what is not good. But to make things what is not good, how much are you ready to pray? If you don't pay a price, you don't see the result. Anybody who has paid the price to the scriptures, we see not just the scriptures, not just the heroes of the scriptures, but also the people that have gone before us, people who have paid a price have seen the hand of God working. We can all complain about things. But how much are we ready to pray? But before you pray, understand, you are the righteous image of Jesus Christ. Let alone no person, let no person on earth, under heaven, come and talk you down that you and your prayer will not work. It could be a simple prayer. Last week, I, I, uh, um, so I was talking to one of our youngsters and they said, Pastor, I've been praying early in the morning and I could just pray for three minutes. I was very happy that the person prayed at least three minutes. And I said, really good. You did a good job. But next time, increase from three minutes. Let there be a desperate need in your heart that from three, you continue to go. We encourage people. Is that true? As we, that, that is how you have to understand your prayer is valuable. 
Some of us take prayer as a punishment given to our life. And yes, of course, when I was growing up, you know, prayer was introduced as, a, as, as, as something that I must do. If not, I'll not get food in the night, you know. So I need to pray. And I prayed just because I wanted to eat my dinner. But later on, I understood prayer was a constant communication with my lover. Prayer was a constant communication with my maker. I didn't do it because of the compulsion of people. I did it because I wanted to be with my maker. I did it because I understood from the scriptures that I've been made the right image with God. How can I sit away when I've been made the right inheritance of the inheritance God has provided for me in heavenly realms? And I prayed because there was a push from my heart to commune with my Holy Spirit, to commune with my maker. And that is the story of every single person. Prayer should not come as a compulsion. Prayer should not come because you need an answer. Prayer should come constantly because you want to have a relationship with your maker. It is the language that you build with your maker. Hallelujah. Some of us, when we ask them to pray, put them on spot, you just have three words to say. It's okay, but you can improve from there. How deep, how vast you can grow. Hallelujah. When, you know, you, when, when, in, in relationships, husband and wife, if you can say only I love you to for 40 years, I don't think that is healthy. You grow from I love you to more conversations, healthy conversations. How you explain your love to your beloved one. Am I talking to some married people here? You grow in that relationship. Hallelujah. I was with somebody recently and I asked them to pray for the food. They prayed for the food and they prayed for every single thing because they didn't know what to pray for really. <laughs> Some people intentionally, I don't ask them to pray for the food because I know it won't stop immediately. They go all over the place but the food. <laughs> know your real place in prayer. We are missing that out. Know your real place in prayer. You don't pray as a slave. You pray as a son. You don't pray as a slave. You pray as a son. Why? Because this is the constant communication you have with our maker. James is helping us understand. I know these words can go in different formats. But James is helping us to understand. Elijah was a man. Just the nature like ours. Some of you are hot-headed. Some of you are cold-headed. Some of you are really aggressive and stuff. Some of you are not. In all of this, it all sums up to how Elijah was. Elijah prayed. Things happened. You pray, things will happen. Can I have the worship team behind me? When you pray, things will happen. The prayer of fervent people. I want some prayer warriors in churches to rise today. This is When I was preparing this message, the Lord was pouring so much into my heart. The Lord was talking so much that you need to raise some prayer warriors. It's not that we don't have prayer warriors. We do have. We have prayer from morning 5 o'clock that happens, 5.30 that takes place in our church during Tuesdays and Wednesdays and throughout the week we have prayer. But still, we need some prayer warriors. We need some prayer warriors. Are you trying to understand this? We want you to stay up, stand up in the midst when there are problems that we cannot stand up. I want some prayer warriors. And I know some of our amachis, some of our opportunities here constantly call me and they tell me, Pastor, we are praying. But I need more people. More people. And this message is for the, the youth of our church as well. That your constant prayer works, my friend. Please pray. In your dorms, in your school, in places where you gather. Pray. Can we all stand up in God's house? Can we all stand up? I want you to intentionally pray. Your prayer works. Your prayer works. Your prayer works. When you sit down with your friends, when you talk to them about stuff that you are going through in your school, in your stuff, you know, pray with them. Pray with them. Your prayer works. Your prayer works. Your prayer works. And Bible helps us to understand. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. But he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years, six months, it did not on earth. Why? Because in the desperate moment, he realized his position in prayer. And he prayed a fervent prayer. Today, I'm challenging some of our folks here. Find people that you can pray for. Find people that you can pray for. Find people that you can pray for. Because your prayer is valuable. 
We're all busy in our own stuff. We go for a 40 hour job. We try to make it 60 hours as possible for the extra paycheck. All that is good for the life of your family. But don't forget the main fact of it is a prayer for one another is scriptural. Pray for one another. It's scripture when you find somebody who is going through real stuff of their life. Understand the God of Elijah is your God. And he works the same wonders through your prayers. Shut those doors that have been opened in their life. The doors of distraction that has been opened in the life of some of our people. Let it be shut forever. In the power and anointing of Elijah. Speak life into those situations. Let it stay. I shut it out. How desperate are you today? As you sing that beautiful song behind us, um, let's, let's understand the desperation. How desperate. Lord, I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate for you. Every eye closed and no distractions. I'm desperate for you. Father, I'm desperate for you. I'm desperate for a move.